and talk about celebrating. The overtime conversation has been a big deal, uh, obviously because these new overtime rules. Inside the NFL just released some mic'd up situations where seemingly Frazier, I believe is the guy's name, who's yeah. the Ed, Ernie Adams, seemingly, <laughs> of the Kansas City Chiefs, where he broke down <laughs> what the overtime rules are and what we want. So as soon as the San Francisco 49ers say they want the ball, you immediately know, okay, we got to hold them to three or less, and with Patrick Mahomes, we're going to win this game. Is that the mindset as soon as it kind of happens, Coach? Well, from a defensive standpoint, Pat, I mean, our mindset is it never changes. I mean, we're going out there to try to prevent uh, points on the board. Uh, it wasn't like, hey, we can give them a field goal and we're okay. We don't want to give them anything. I mean, quite frankly, the one that, you know, the play that sticks in my car a little bit is that third and 13. Unfortunately, we get a penalty on it. Otherwise, we get them to punt the ball and then. You know, maybe Patrick just has to leave us, lead us down to a field goal and win the game. But listen, we, our team, our defense, our players all know uh, what we have on our offensive side of the ball. We know who we turn it over to. And so if you can, I mean, it was vital that we didn't let him score a touchdown. Didn't want him to even kick a field goal. But with three points and, and Patrick going out there, I mean, we at least had the confidence that we might get another shot to go out, right? If we, if we kick a field goal and we tie, we get to go back out defensively. So... Coach, felt good. Coach, let's talk about your defense. You said, I think during the playoff run, you said I have all 11 guys have a high football IQ. You say yep. normally there's at least one or two guys or whatever the case is. At what point during the season do you recognize that? And can you just dial up anything? you? What does that mean for you as a defensive player? You could just do a lot more. It gives you more freedom. What does that do for you having guys that smart on the field? Yeah, it yeah, it made us much more mul – we like to be multiple, okay, Pat? We've always been like that. But it allowed us to do more um, – and, and, and the statement I've made, because I've been blessed to work with a lot of high IQ football – Antonio Pierce, who's now a head coach in the league. I mean, Tyron Matthew. I mean, I can go on and on. James Laronitis when I was in St. Louis. But this was the highest number of guys on one unit that we've had. And when you have that – I mean, you feel confident in any type of in-game adjustment, anything new that you put in during the week, that the guys are just going to embrace it and roll with it. And they did that all year long. Even when we had injuries, Pat, we had guys that would step right in there from a mental standpoint and do the job. I think, to be quite honest with you, Pat, I think that's a credit to our assistant coaches to have guys like that ready, you know, mentally to go in a game and not skip a beat. Drew Tranquil? Coming to us, you know, new from the Chargers, and Nick gets hurt, Nick Bolton. We step in, we don't skip a beat because he's a high cerebral, high IQ guy, and we were able to keep him doing the things we do. How many times have you said wicked in your life, Coach? <laughs> you, you get the Boston accent coming up. <laughs> oh, my God, you said Chargers? <laughs> I, 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 you, said, you just parked a car in the garage right there with the Chargers. I mean, I heard the Dunk King's commercial uh -huh. coming through your spirit. I didn't know you were – I mean, that's awesome. I, I couldn't even imagine when you're coaching that, that whole accent coming out. That's beautiful. That's half the, yeah, half the time they can't understand what I'm saying because of that accent. Because It's funny. I haven't lived there in 30-some-odd years, but it's, it's stuck with me, I guess. Yeah, as it should. Oh, Never yeah. lose it. It's a beautiful thing. No. Accents and dialect are a massive piece of culture and I think somebody's identity, and you should be proud of it. So I hope you keep yeah, it forever. I, the um, Let's talk about the last play. Well, third and four. Let's talk about third and four. Yeah. Okay. You guys obviously know they pick up that first down, drain the clock, kick the field goal, it's probably over. You show left, yeah. seemingly, then McDuffie times that thing up perfectly. Is that an audible on the field? Is that a call? How much freedom is there to kind of maybe switch sides on what you're doing based on what the other team sets up with? Well, I'll tell you what happened there, Pat, on that one, and that was a critical play. I mean, sometimes you don't real realize how important a certain play is when you're in the moment, but, you know, that the... the that was right before that play. It was getting close to the two-minute warning. So San Francisco let it come down. We had, we had made a call. They had come to the line of scrimmage, if you guys remember. We had made a call, but they allowed the clock to come down in two minutes. So now we have a little bit of time to think about it. At that point, I had a thought. We should treat it like fourth down. I had some calls on my fourth down sheet. I got on the headset, and I looked directly at Nick Bolton because I have all the confidence in the world. And I said, Nick, what do you think about – such and such call and when i saw his reaction was so yes let's do it and he was doing it with his hands i said I, that's the one we got to go with so we put a new personnel in and the guys executed what we had decided during practice that we would run like in a critical fourth down and to us that was like a fourth down like we had to win that down um and listen credit to nick you know having you know being that confident in the call and making me feel that way i mean that's 
That's the confidence I have in him. And then the guys to go out there and execute. Hey, that's like we Philly, Philly. That sounds like Philly, yeah. Philly almost. Yep. Yep. If you think about how important that play was, I mean, Bolton- I did. I hadn't thought about that till you said it, Pat. But listen, that's the belief you have in players, right? And a guy like Nick, he's our quarterback. He's our Patrick Mahomes. And when he nods his head and says, yes, that's the one to go with, I'm all for it. That, take, that makes my job a lot easier. Steve, we uh, we are baffled by the fact that you didn't get any head coaching interviews seemingly. Wow. And I want to let you know, we're also very pissed that you're back, Andy's back, <laughs> Patrick's back, <laughs> Toby's back, what? Travis is back. It's not fun for the rest of us, but I can see why <laughs> every player that's ever yep. played for you loves you. Speaking of playing for you, you did a little something different than everybody else. Tone has a question for you, Coach. Yeah, Coach, it came out from people that were watching the film, and who knows how correct it is, but they it showed that you ran the highest percentage of, of man against the Niners by far that they have faced this season. It was a... How? When did you know coming into the game that that that's what you were gonna do? And is it is it just because of the absolute dogs that you have on, on the back end that you thought you could match up well against their weapons? Well, that has a lot to do with it. Um, I will say this: uh, the reason we shifted gears there were, was twofold. A, I thought I got a great deal of respect for Brock Purdy. To be honest with you, man, he I, he was yeah. exceptional. As I watched him during the week, I thought he was exceptional. He scared us in a lot of different ways. But the way he attacked zones and the timing, you guys probably talked about it all week, is in breaking routes and mm-hmm. he's throwing it before the TV even makes his final break. And he hit a couple of those on us. And we just decided that we needed tighter coverage. We knew we had the guys to do it, Trent and LJ and, and Josh and Jalen when they went out there. So we made that shift. Now, I was feeling it in the second quarter, but kind of went heavy on it in the second half, the very first three plays, I believe, of the second half were all man. Uh, I just watched it just not a half hour ago again, and I thought the coverage was tight. But that was that was confidence in the guys we had and, and really a credit to or compliment to Kyle Shanahan and his quarterback and how good they are against zone coverage. Okay, we'll talk about you watching the film uh-huh. again here after, yeah. you know. Yeah. Who are you doing? You're giving grades right now? Nobody. I mean, I'm not even. I'm not even getting into it. You're. You're a football psycho. You can't help yourself. You can't help us. Yeah, you're a football no. psycho. Hey, we got this stat from Hembo uh, immediately after the Super Bowl. Your Chiefs defense faced the number two, three, four, and six offenses in the NFL this season in the playoffs. They combined to average 28.3 points per game during the season against your defense. Only 15.8. Okay, against you guys. Why do you think during the playoff run? When the best teams are playing and the best offenses are there and everybody's at their height and their best, why do you think you were able to kind of do something that nobody else was able to do these defenses? Like that Miami defense, obviously it's negative 15 or whatever. They're going to say that's the case. (laughs) Josh Allen, though, and the Bills were rolling. Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens were seemingly unstoppable, just a machine. Is it like, do you just come up with like... The strategy, the scheme, obviously you're going to say your players because the way you are, but like, yeah. why do you think your te- defense played the best ball whenever it had to against the best offenses in the entire NFL? You know, Pat, I think some of that can go back to the fact that we had guys that had been through this before. I mean, a number of our guys, we were young, um, we're still young, but we were really young last year, and they kind of went through it. And we've got some veteran leadership that recognize the guys that recognize the moment. Chris Jones, I mean, LJ Sneed now, Justin Reed, Nick Bolton. I mean, guys that have been in this kind of battle. And, and listen, we all know defensively that if you don't step it up on that side of the ball in the playoffs, you're really not going to go anywhere. It's hard in this league to outscore people and we certainly don't want to do that to you know andy patrick and the whole offense we want to do our share and we know our share is to get the ball back to the offense with as many many minimal points as possible uh and i think our guys as a credit to the to the coaches and the players to go out there and play the way they did the intensity the passion that our guys play with is just remarkable hey i heard practice banging Super Bowl week. I heard we were getting after it too all the way through. That's a is that every Super Bowl? Did Andy change that this year? What was it? Well, no, he no. We stuck to what we do is on Monday we put the Andy puts the pads, shoulder pads back on. Now, now we're not killing each other, Pat, but we were out there. I heard it got. Get, hey, I heard it got pretty. It, hey, we heard it got no, pretty it was. real. No, they were the guys were into it. Well, listen, they they didn't play a game on a Sunday, so they they needed that weekly, you know, 
hitting people, and we got after it pretty good without hurting each other. It was great. It was great. It was great practice to be a part of. Yeah, I bet you. Yeah. Coaches love that. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Yeah, awesome. coaches love that. Some players are like, what the hell are we doing out here today? This is Super Bowl. <laughs> coaches are like, uh -huh. you see the boys hurt. Unreal. They're ready to go. Yeah. One of the guys you mentioned there, obviously, Yvette, going to be a free agent. Connor has a question for you. Yeah, Coach, you said Nick Bolton's the Mahomes of the defense. It feels like Chris Jones is probably the Travis Kelsey then on the other side on that defensive line. And yesterday he said he was coming back for another three years. And <laughs> his agent wasn't too happy about the amount of booze in him <laughs> yeah. and that he was being served. But that was probably music to your ears. But how awesome is it being able to, you know, talk to Bolton and also know all those guys on the back end can do their jobs when you got, you know, Chris Jones and you only need to cover guys for two seconds because how good he is. And what does he bring yeah. to the defense, just even on a day-to-day -day basis as one of those leaders on that front seven? Yeah, Chris, Chris is a character that came out yesterday, obviously. And you're right about his agents. They were probably a little squirmy in their seats. But he, <laughs> listen, he, uh, the thing about Chris is his personality never changes. Like, what you see is what he is. And he's he's great to work with during the week. He keeps everybody loose. Um, and he knows, he recognizes the importance of an important moment. And that's when he usually shines. But I tell you what, the you know, you mentioned all those guys, which I think was great because it took a whole unit. But... When I, when I throw the tape on, what I get the most satisfaction out of is when the rush and the coverage kind of come together. In other words, you watch LJ and Trent, and they got tight coverage, and so the quarterback's got to hold it for another half a second, and then boom, there's Chris Jones or Mike Dane or, or, or George Kyle Loftus. And, and that's how this unit has functioned all year long. Each piece kind of plays its part, and it makes the other part the other parts better. And a guy in the middle, like I keep coming back to Nick, but the guy in the middle makes it all go. It's, it's a fun defense to watch. It really is. Yeah. And then as we talk to, like, Eli Manning, who described Antonio Pierce, who described you yeah. as Spags, it's like as you start watching, it's like, oh, this is all – everybody's on a string here. It, it, everybody's playing the same music. You know, one band, one sound. Mm. That, that, that is kind of how right. it's all going. It's championship yeah. run. Now, what's your relationship like with Patrick? Because Patrick, uh, I think after the first playoff game – he said about halfway through the season, I had to evolve as a player and realize, like, we got a defense that's really good, so I don't need to maybe risk it as much. We can punt the ball and let our defense kind of do its thing. That was interesting to hear, especially from a guy who everybody wants to say, like, this is the greatest quarterback of all time. His ego could get in the way and say, like, no, yeah. offense is going to do this. So for yeah. him to be open and say, like, I had to realize – that I need to not mess it up for our defense in the middle of the season. What is your relationship with him, and what do you see behind the scenes out of that guy that, like, legitimizes all the GOAT talk that's currently happening just six years into his NFL career? Yeah, I mean, listen, what you're saying is exactly – uh, Patrick's a team guy. He's all about winning. He's all about team. And, and you know, when you're on the other side of the ball, that makes you feel tremendously good. That, that was a huge, huge co compliment that Pat – paid to all of the defensive coaches and players when he made that statement. And we believe in him the same way. And it's a two-way street here. But you watch Pat Patrick Mahomes operate day to day. He walks by my office every day on his way to the quarterback meeting room or when he's on the field. And it's always about making all the other guys better. It's not it, it, Patrick doesn't sit out there and make it all about him. He wants to he wants to win so bad. He doesn't care how it happens, and that's the beauty of Patrick Mahomes, and it's the beauty of the rest of the guys who have all kinds of confidence in him, and they they'll roll with him at any time. We rolled with him. They like I say, thank God we had Patrick Mahomes at the end of the game because you know you give up a field goal and you're just not really sure what's going to happen, and he comes right down and scores, and we all Spags. celebrate. We all knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh -huh. Watching. I mean, every, everybody watching, literally. Everybody watching, yeah. I guess, except for Niners fans, probably. And that Niners defense, yeah. phenomenal Great. as well. Like, not even. Okay. But it's just, thought, yeah. he, he already has, like, the Tom Brady effect. Like, oh, you gave Patrick Mahomes a chance here. Right. And he's going to go. He's only 28 years old. Mm. Specs. He's only. It makes no sense. Amazing. He's, no. He talked about growing up in a locker room. You think that helped, obviously? I, I got to believe it did. I tell you what I've been trying to do, guys. I wanted to see if he could be the first two-way player. <laughs> we can get him over safety, get him to play corner. I don't know how the coach Reed's going to go for it, but how about that, right? That Wouldn't that set a legacy? Hey, he's got some speed, too. You know, he'll, he'll start opening up the stride listen, a little bit. Listen, this that guy can do whatever he wants. If he wanted to be a the ping-pong champion, he could do that. He could, be a, he could be a golf pro if he wanted to be. I mean, he's just that. 
naturally gifted and he's a great person. I love being around him. I mean, just all kinds of energy. Well, he's very thankful that you're the defense coordinator for his team and that the rest of the NFL is seemingly not interested in you. Man. How about no more yeah. old people are allowed to be hired nope. as head coaches? Yeah. No chance. Which sucks, Bags. I want to let you know that sucks. <laughs> you're not supposed to be there for three more years. Bruce has a question uh, for you, diehard Giants fan. Yeah, Coach, first of all, sure. thank you for the contributions to those uh, mm. Giants Super Bowls. Um, I read that at halftime against the Bills, um, you kind of switched the defensive line's rushing lanes and um, played more zone coverage in the second half where you were playing man in the first half. Can you just talk a bit about how you approach halftime adjustments and how important those were to the Super Bowl run? Yeah, Bruce, I, listen, um, the one of the things about halftime adjustments is if you're making – I mean, we all have, as coaches, have ideas of, uh, we need to change this, we need to do that, but – a lot of times it depends on what the players can handle. And I'm going to go back to what, what Pat brought up about the, the number of high, high Q plays we have. You can't make those adjustments on the run in a 12-minute halftime adjustment period unless you have guys that you know can mentally you know, absorb it first and then produce it on the field. I, it's funny. I, I don't. My mind is blocked on the Buffalo game. I'm sure what you're saying is, is true. I just know that the job. <laughs> Josh Allen is not an easy guy to defend. He's one of the toughest ones in the league. And we we kind of scratched and battled in that game. I mean, he got him down there and they missed that field goal, thank God for us. But um, anytime yeah. we feel like we're making a good halftime adjustment, it's just because we're complimenting what we think our players could do. Yeah, and the high football IQ, that's like what the Patriots had for all that time, where they were able to have four yeah. different strategies seemingly going into the game, yeah. making quarterbacks see ghosts. Feels like you guys are in the middle of that run. Can you take me through a week for you? So, like, Sunday game, then yeah. Sunday night, we're starting to plan for the next quarterback offense, and then you're putting your – by what time do you know what you're going to be doing to the next team? Because right now you're the guy on the defense side. Oh, yeah. Hey, you're the guy <laughs> on the defense side of the ball. So I would just like to know, like, your process. So at what yeah. moment, like on a Tuesday, do you know what the plan's going to be for Wednesday install? Like, when do you know what you're going to do to the person? Well, I mean, first of all, you guys know it's not one guy. I mean, I, I keep going back. To OC, the OC, 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 OC. I'm sorry. But, yeah. Yeah. No, but you know what I mean. It's 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 really important that uh, – and we're a collaborative group when we do a game plan. Um, listen, when a game ends on Sunday, if it's an away game, I'm on the plane. We all watch it and then try to get some rest Sunday night. But Monday's a complete grind with no players there. Uh, players usually come in on Tuesday. I would say – by the time we get to Tuesday evening, we have a pretty good idea of what we're gonna of what we're gonna do. Now, there's some situational things that come up later in the week, and I, to be honest with you guys, I always begin myself by looking at third down, fourth down, two minute, like all the critical situations I do on Monday before we get together as a staff and start doing first and second down. But we 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 have a we have a great group that works collaboratively through the week, and then. Again, we keep coming back to the players um, because they can absorb it and embrace it and they work at understanding it. You know, something good comes out on Sunday. Are all your coaches back next year? Uh, as of right now, yeah, fortunately for us. I tell you, that's one thing. I was just talking to one of our assistants now, baby. There's, we got three young guys here, quality control guys, that should be, you know, full-time assistants right now. But sometimes when you go on these long playoff runs, and it's been five years for us, you know, fortunately for us, we don't ever want to give it up. But all these jobs for these sure. guys go by the wayside because people don't want to wait, and it's a it's a blessing and a curse. But I, we've got a, We've got a great staff here. I know there'll be a, there'll be great coordinators. Some of them are going to be head coaches, and I can't wait till that happens for them. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, it'll happen sooner or later for the rest of everybody in the NFL. Amen. You, know, you got yeah. the whole staff back. You're, he's in our <laughs> staff's great. It's bullshit. Staff is great. Staff's yeah. phenomenal. They're they're all back. The players no, seemingly that, it's against the rules. Yeah, they're all. They're all back. Well, I tell you the one the one thing I do fear, guys. We have a we have a quite a number of defensive guys whose contracts are up, and we know we can't, you know, we can't keep everybody. One of the things I was praying for each week during the playoffs was to get another week working with these guys because I, you know, I've been mm -hmm. in it long enough. You guys know it changes every year. That room changes, and this was one of the best rooms I've ever been blessed to have. And working with them every day was just a joy. So it'll change. You know, every every group every group changes. Yeah, Veach will figure it out. Yes, that, that's will. a whole, yeah, I mean, it's right. a whole, which 
He should have to retire too. <laughs> Amen. Connor's no. got a question for you, Coach. No, I need my guy Veach. I, I you know, don't let my guy Veach get out. No, no, we need him to retire. We need you to retire. Mm -hmm. We need Reed to retire. Right. We need Patrick Mahomes to say, you know what, four is enough. Him retire. Right. We need the whole thing, Spags. That's what we need. Connor's got a question for you. Yeah, Coach, when you're going into games against teams, and whether it's the playoffs or even later in the season, like, for instance, the, the Niners, I believe their last loss before you guys was to the Ravens. Now, do you go back and do you watch – tape of the Ravens to see what they're doing and then do you pull from that whether it be plays or strategies that they're using or is it mostly like hey we do what we do I'm coach Spags I'm the best DC in the history of the National Football <laughs> League I don't need to pull from anybody or how or how does that work no but I'll tell you this first of all that was one of the games we looked at because uh Mike McDonald actually Mike and I worked together at Baltimore he was my quality control and so there's some similarities in the scheme but I'm hey we're a beg borrow and steal profession i mean i'm not that listen I'll, I'll i'll steal an idea or take something somebody else said we're not that uh stuck on what we do but i think there is something to be said for going and looking at tape of a team that successfully defended an offense so there is a lot of that baltimore was one of the games we picked out there was a couple others um and then we we believe in looking at games of teams that have a similar defense to we run like a four down front as opposed to a three four because we think like one game uh people will attack it the same way but baltimore was one of those games i thought they did a terrific job against san francisco in that game they played them. okay well let's talk about some of these teams because it feels like you are the puppet master for well you and your staff obviously yep. and your team yeah. coach uh digs got a question for you last one actually yeah coach sure. a, lo a lot of people were shocked or surprised that the ravens and the niners particularly in the third quarter just stopped running the football now was that a shock to you or as well or was that your goal was that part of the game plan to get because that was there obviously those two team strengths mostly and is that yeah. is that something that you, you wanted to happen obviously yeah because we were told Roger Goodell told them yeah, yeah they're yeah. not allowed to run anymore because Taylor Swift needs to make the yep. Super Bowl <laughs> the Taylor, you guys are into the Taylor Swift effect right? Whoa! Yeah, yeah. Whoa! Just telling you what I was told on the internet. No, but that was a conversation. Like, hey, they stopped doing what they were good at. And yeah. everybody's like, that's yeah. a bad decision by them. But we think there's a chance that you potentially, your defense was a reason why they did that. Was that a surprise to you? And did you expect it? Great question, Tone. Well, what you're saying is is true. I mean, one of our goals against both those teams was to stop the run force, to try to get them one-dimensional. Um, now, both games were close enough that I thought maybe they would stick with it a little bit more. But look at, you know, those are those are smart offensive coaches. They make decisions for certain reasons. And I think in both those games, we at least, I thought, hung in there against the run. And maybe they decided that the best way for them to um, – you know, get some points on the board, be a little bit more explosive was to throw it. But Love. listen, we got to defend whatever they do. And I, I, we were scared to death of both those teams right <laughs> the football. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're going to be scared to death to a couple more championships over the next few years, because <laughs> for some reason, everybody's staying nice. mm -hmm. in beautiful Kansas city. Thank you so much for the time. What's the off season look like? You're already watching film. We're already preparing. We're doing a little film, but I'm, I listen, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. I'm going to go down to sunny Miami, enjoy a little bit of time okay. down there with my wife because she deserves it, and then uh, then get back here and get back at it. I'll, tell I'll you be the, the combine's right around the corner, guys. It's like two weeks from now we're at the combine. It's like it happens quick. Yeah, we did not know that. We actually nope. scheduled off for the combine. It's in <laughs> Indianapolis. We had, we thought it was at least a month away. It's very <laughs> quick. Boom. It's right there. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, if we're um, if we're doing anything at the combine, will you stop by? We'll be in the in the stadium if we're doing anything. Absolutely. Bank it. Put it put it in the books. Boom. All right, we will put it in the books. First. En enjoy <laughs> Miami. You're the man, ladies and gentlemen. Four times Super Bowl champion, Thanks. defense coordinator Thanks. for the Chiefs, Steve Spagnuolo. Yeah, coach. Did we know that he had that? big of a wicked accent out of Boston. Awesome. I knew he was a mask guy. Um, I, I think maybe it's because he coached for the Giants. Uh, I did not know that. I thought he was like a New York accent type guy, but boy, that guy is from the heart of Massachusetts. How about like, when he said the charges they did this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he sounded like the Dung Kings yeah. commercial. 4-3. You know, we look at guys who run a 4-3 front instead of a 3-4. Yeah, Drew Twank. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was... I did not expect that out of him. No. I, I should have known a little bit more about him. The, the amount of pass off credit to other people. Of course. Awesome.